Hello, it's the 18th of March, 2016, and this is episode 47 of the Unseen Podcast. The Unseen Podcast is the unscripted, unedited, open participation, creative, common spinoff of the WOW Signal. For more information about the WOW Signal, go to wowsignalpodcast.com. For more information about this podcast, please see Unseen podcast.com. As I just noted, it is open participation. That does include you. You are invited to join us on a panel. Uh, Go to unseenpodcast.com to learn more about how you can participate. It's really not very hard. Okay. Uh, Tonight, I have with me from left to right on my hangout screen, I have James Garrison. How's it going, everyone? I have Mike Bowler. Hello, everyone. And uh, and Nick Nielsen. Hello, Paul, and hello, everyone. These guys have all been on before. If you want to see their bios, go to unseenpodcast.com. They're out there. Um, And uh, James is is on Twitter. And Mike Bowler has a podcast, uh, Skeptic's Guide to Conspiracy. And, of course, Nick is a world-famous blogger and often contributor to the WOW Signal as well. So uh, tonight has been Bring Your Own Topic Night because our topics thread crashed and burned about a week ago. We never really got it back going back again. We originally were, we had some good ideas about talking about microbes in space, but we never developed that to the point that I was happy with because, well, I mean, my knowledge of microbiology is, is pathetic. Uh, probably less than I think I, it is. And uh, so I needed some help. I never got the help I needed. So uh, what I decided we would do tonight, instead of canceling the show, which was actually on the table, as far as I'm concerned, uh, James has pointed out that they're very small, which I did not know. Thank you, James. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Actually, that's what that's the one thing I probably could have gotten right. <laughs> they're they're really small. You can't see them without one of these uh, thingamajiggers. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, what do you call what do you call them? A uh, microscope? Yeah. Uh, what the hell is it? Uh, or you know, or, or Raquel Welch, and you go down and no, uh, that, that's a really old movie reference that you young people mm-hmm. won't get. <laughs> I, I got it. <laughs> mm-hmm. if, if Raquel Welch could, if the young Raquel Welch could come with you, uh, we'd all be microbiologists, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, tonight's bringing our, t- now I wanted to raise a couple of points. First, a couple of sort of updates to things that we've talked about in the recent past. Uh, the first one, and I'll have links in the show notes where you can go see for yourself what's going on here. Um, In episode 20, we talked to Dr. Pamela Gay, astronomer and citizen science mastermind. And during that that podcast, she expressed some, I don't know how I want to phrase that exactly. She expressed some some, uh, doubts about her future as uh, at, at her current institution in Illinois and where she was going to go from there because she didn't seem to have a grant for next year. And she was applying for grants everywhere uh, f- in support of one of her major uh, ventures in citizen science, which is called CosmoQuest, which does a lot of, of support of planetary science, among other things. And uh, like, for example, uh, cataloging features on the moon or, or uh st- uh, I kept saying series. It was Vesta, Vesta, where she was doing that. I uh, and if you listen to that podcast, I keep saying series, and she meant Vesta. Uh, I get, keep getting it wrong. Uh, but the good news is she has received a large grant, I believe, from NASA. I'll check on that. But um, to continue with CosmoQuest, uh, and this grant is big enough that it will carry her for for a while. And also supply plenty of of money to keep CosmoQuest itself going. So uh, congratulations, Dr. Gay. Well done. I know she worked extremely hard to make that happen. 
along with her many collaborators. So uh, well done. And we'll have link again, we'll have links in the show notes. Go to unseenpodcast.com to learn more about what she's up to. And you can participate in that. If you want to get involved in classifying features on Mars or Vesta or anywhere else, uh, that that is something you can do. And I'm talking, yeah, I'm talking to you. Not not that guy, not that smart guy over there. Uh, <laughs> you can do it. And uh, another thing I wanted to bring up, uh, unrelated to that, is a little bit of update to the fast radio burst topic that we talked about a couple episodes ago, uh, where we we brought up these very puzzling high energy bursts that are being sensed essentially all over the sky, but so far only seen in three of the most sensitive radio telescopes that that are available. This week I had a conversation with Jason Hessels, who's a Netherlands radio astronomer, and he has done a lot of the – he is the corresponding author for the paper that reported a repeating fast radio burst. And he told me a couple of things that I thought were kind of new – uh, and I'll summarize them for you here, but please go to wowsignalpodcast.com to get the full scoop. But he, one thing he told me was they have since detected more repetitions of that burst at Arecibo, and they have not yet written those up, but they will as soon as they can. So the, the repetition of the burst continues. That's an interesting datum. The other thing is that no bursts have been discovered at LOFAR, which is a big radio array in the Netherlands and has, a, I think, has a few outlying uh, arrays around the rest of Europe. Uh, and they fully expect to see these bursts at LOFAR, and they don't know why they haven't. But it's a, it, it's, it's a clue to the nature of the burst that they haven't seen these. LOFAR uh, operate well, the low in LOFAR stands for low frequency, uh, so they're, they're looking at a frequency that's about a tenth of what they're looking at in um, at Arecibo or Parks Radio Observatory in Australia. And they haven't seen any fast radio bursts in that array. And he believes that it is sensitive enough to have detected many. This is a, a, an array with a very wide field of view, so it should detect a lot of bursts. So that's another thing. And he, he also hinted, at least, that he was going to be writing that up, uh, this negative detection of fast radio bursts at LOFAR. So, uh, and he's he's really working hard right now to figure out why they haven't seen them, and, and maybe they have, but they just, just buried in the data and they're they're trying to dig it up. So... Were they were they specifically looking for it, or were they digging through their own data? Well, I mean, LOFAR, LOFAR is... Its mission is sort of to detect transient events in the sky. It's not it doesn't focus down on specific sources. So yeah, they were looking for it, but these events are so, are so rapid. They happen in a millisecond or two that they may have missed them in the data. So what they're doing now is, is going on to try to find out, have we really not seen them or have we just been fooled by the noise in our system? And so uh, that's an ongoing project right now. And I don't know where it's going to go. Uh, hopefully, I'll have some more information to report in the next few months. Uh, but uh, LOFAR looks at a much lower frequency, as I've noted, a more what what used to be called VHF. Uh, if you had a, t- a television set twenty years ago, you might know what VHF <laughs> means. Uh, or if you had a if you're an, if you're an amateur radio operator, you know what VHF is. Uh, it used to stand for very high. It stood for very high frequency, which at the time people thought these were high frequencies. Now they, they're very ordinary frequencies. <laughs> short wave used to mean high frequency, right? Short short wavelength. Of course, it's now ridiculously long wavelength <laughs> compared to what we normally use in everyday on our cell phones and our and our cordless phones at home and and our Bluetooth headsets and everything else. Uh, it's not short wave at all. It's, but compared to AM radio, it's shorter. So, uh, and I, I am one who was a, in my 
childhood and teenage years was a shortwave fanatic. Uh, I'd listen to all the strange sounds available on shortwave. Uh, and if you've ever read um, Thomas Pinchon's novel, uh, V, it mentions some of the weird sounds that you can hear on shortwave. Yeah, okay. I used, get, I used to get a kick out of listening to the uh, number stations, wherever they were coming from. Yeah, the number stations. Yeah. And, and uh, I remember during the Vietnam War, listening to Radio Hanoi and their propaganda, yeah. or Radio Moscow during were the, the Cold were those War. Both, were those both uh, generated in English or transmitted? In yes, English? they had English. Yeah. Uh, they had English trend th- broadcasts. Uh, it was kind of listening to, to Tokyo Rose during the war, I suppose. Although I, <laughs> I, I was, I was uh, still not even a concept in those days. Yeah, I used to <laughs> listen a lot to radio, uh, Radio Cuba, and Radio think, Havana uh, Cuba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was an easy one to get. Uh, radio Moscow. There was uh, what's the Czechoslovakian one? Radio Prague. Yeah. So, so that though those were, I still got the QSL cards from that. Oh, I, I lost I lost all my QSL cards. Uh, of course, we're talk. the yeah, we're talking one. over people's heads right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> with uh, with the emergence of computers as a form of uh, enthusiasm for young people with an interest in electronics, I suspect the the number of people who who build their own shortwave sets and operate them has, has plummeted. So there's a whole area of hobby electronics that has. Um, that well, is yeah, but of course up. you don't have to build your own. There's a, on one chip, you can put a whole shortwave radio now. So. Right, right. I mean, but the, there was a whole culture around built around people who, who built their own. So I, I, you know, you yeah, I, I built on, my own heath kit. Well, and you could, you could get books uh, on, on how to, you know, build your own, you know, how to stamp the metal so you could put the vacuum tube in its own rack and, you know, solder. I mean, building the whole thing from scratch, the only thing you bought were the parts and, and, and the wire, basically. Right. Yeah. Well, you could do that if you were skilled enough with the, if you were a skilled maker. But you think maker culture hasn't disappeared. It just moved into yeah. other areas. That's true. It's moved into other areas. Uh, vacuum tubes are pretty much not part of that, although I suppose there's probably somebody out there in some subculture building vacuum tube audio amplifiers. Oh, oh there, there, there's a specialist store in Portland that sells uh, what are considered classic, you know, vacuum tube uh, the, uh, audio components for people who are really into that. Uh, well, I'm actually speaking to you right now through a vacuum tube preamplifier, so. Uh, and, of course, anybody who's into um, uh, playing music, uh, usually most guitarists prefer a vacuum tube amplifier. Yeah, they want to. They all want to sound like Keith mm-hmm. Richards. <laughs> Who probably don't want to look like him. <laughs> they want to live as long as him and, and still abuse their bodies, <laughs> like he does. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of pushing our luck. I think. <laughs> yeah. Problem is, you want to be able to remember what you did ten minutes ago. Oh well, then don't be like Keith Richards. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, okay. That's all I have for now. Um, how about you, James? Okay. Um, I was going to say my, you know, you said it's going to be choose your own topic. So there's one that's been, I've been hearing about for a couple of weeks and it's been just irking the crap out of me. Uh, but in Canada, there was a family that their son developed uh, viral meningitis and from all the reports I've been able to read instead of going to the doctor they were giving him uh, diluted maple syrup and this is a 19 I believe a 19 month old child uh, that they were giving him let me look right here I'm, I'm using Washington Post story right now they're giving him smoothies with hot pepper ginger root horseradish onion and apple cider vinegar um, diluted maple syrup. They took him to a naturopath for echinacea. Uh, by the time they got him to the hospital, it was too late. Yeah. And it's just, it's one of those things using so-called, you know, alternative medicine, natural cures, things like that to try to 
treat something that if you catch it early enough, you know, actual medicine can do quite a bit. Well, I mean, that smoothie sounds like some of the thing we'd use to make uh, a terrorist talk. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's a war on two fronts right there. Going in, going out. Yeah. So, but flipping through some of the stories, they've also there's also a few articles up right now that from, you know, various natural healing sites and stuff saying, no, the child did not die of meningitis. No, it's not the parent's fault or anything like that. And I'm just kind of going, you know, the Canada is bringing charges against them for, you know, failure to provide necessities of life. Like, life. They haven't been, you know, they've... And some of the stories I've heard, you know, these people also owned a natural, an alternative medicine or natural food store and so they, they really believed in this kind of stuff. And just, one, it terrifies me that somebody would put their kids through something like that. Right. And it's just, and I don't, I don't know what people can do. You know, I mean, we can try to be polite. We can be belligerent. Um, there's just, at times it doesn't seem there's any way to get through to them. They have their... They run on their feels instead of the science, instead of the actual available information. But they must have some kind of support culture, right? I mean, it's not just them. Oh, yeah. The the alternative medicine subculture, I mean, they are a pretty tight-knit group. And even if, you know, they disagree over, you know, the effects of echinacea or something like that or, oh, homeopathy, you know, some of them use homeopathy, some of them don't. But even if they disagree over it, when something like this comes up, I mean, they band together a lot of times. Right. Now, uh, we should point out that if your child has spinal meningitis, that's, uh, if I correct, is that, that's a bacterial infection, right? Well, there's a bacterial and there's a viral. Okay, but it is treatable with, but, uh, treatable with, uh, Highly treatable. One with, yeah, yes. one with antibiotics if you have the bacterial, and you can be vaccinated against the virus. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the baby could have could have survived uh, with a high probability. If, yeah, especially if they'd gotten him. I mean, even with what they were doing, I want to say doing to him because I mean this kind of stuff just pisses me off to no end. Yeah, but, but I mean, um, if you have a baby who's sick, right? The baby's survival is all you think about, right? I mean, or, or right. am I missing yeah. something? No, I mean, I agree. Well, the, I mean, part of the problem was they thought they were thing because there's, you know, how diseases wax and wane, and you know, one day you feel bad, one day you feel better, one day you feel bad again. Right. Um, they were thinking that he'd be bad for a few days and then get better, and they were thinking something they were giving him was working. Uh, one of the alt med pages I was looking at kept calling it having relapses. You really can't have a relapse unless it's under control first. Well, I mean, what, what are they rejecting? Are they rejecting the the germ theory of disease, or are they rejecting <laughs> modern medicine? What are they rejecting? Uh, modern medicine. Um, let me see. Just scanned about halfway down. It says. The family insists they are not anti-medicine. We don't go to the doctor immediately. If it persists, we do. Uh, well, but yeah, apparently but not that's what we do. <laughs> you know, if, if our, my kid is sick, it has a runny nose, I don't take him to the doctor, right? If he right. has a runny nose for five days running it. But meningitis is like really sick. Yeah. Well, I, str- I, strong, I strongly suspect that if you interviewed a bunch of people, uh, even if they all identified them as, say, in, enthusiasts of natural cures, you'd get a variety of different responses because there, there's, a, there's a variety uh, of, of, of views in the compu- community. Some people really are opposed to scientific medicine. Some people really do de- mm-hmm. uh, object to the, the, the germ theory of disease. But some people, um, uh, you know, all those people feel that they're, they're doing the right thing for their kids, even if we can, from the outsider's perspective, it seems... Uh, terribly wrong and 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 gruesome, even you could say. 
Well, so is this the same thing as like uh, rejecting blood transfusions on religious grounds or which can... This was more of a personal. It wasn't like the Mennonites and some of the other religious groups. These were just yeah. people that didn't... Let me see. The idea of boosting an immune system with maple syrup, juice, and frozen fruit... It, I mean, that's some of the stuff that they used. I suspect that it yeah. would serve to feed viruses yeah. and bacteria and actually do the opposite of... Now, this was a phrase I personally hate of boosting the immune system. Yeah, that, you know, that, that's a, that's just bad crazy. You know what boosting you, you know what a boosted immune system is? Inflammation, yes. It's, it's when you have a fever. It's when you have inflammation. Yeah. I do not want to boost my immune system. Right. The, James, the whole alternative or an, al- an allergy in the worst case, right? Uh, is an, the immune system overreacting? In, in the best case, yeah. Uh, James linked to an al- allergy. Say again? Yeah, that was. Uh, James linked to an article uh, titled Boys Fatal Meningitis Treated with Home Remedies in the Discovery News. And I noticed that there's a link to this to another story called Anti-Vaccination Parents Richer, Better Educated, also on Discovery News Network, mm-hmm. which they cite, cite a study that, that uh, you know, against uh, uh, probably a lot of people would assume that it, it's, a, it's a result of ignorance, but it tends to be better educated, wealthier people who are among the anti-vaxxers and probably represented as well among uh, the other classes of, of, of naturopathic and, and uh, non-mainstream treatments. So in, in, in principle, these people ought to be reachable by, by rational argument, but uh, if you've ever engaged somebody like that in conversation, you're not <laughs> likely to be very successful. Well, maybe that's why this is a news item, because this sort of thing is rare, right? I mean... Most parents, it's unfortunately, if they're, not that rare. It's if their baby would had meningitis, they they go to the doctor and say, "Save our baby any way you can." Right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on how far down that rabbit hole they've fallen. Um, I mean, there, there are some people that they'll use willow bark for you know minor fevers or something like that. But then again, willow bark has uh, acetaminophen in it. Or acetylic acid, the same thing. It's basically aspirin, just a very minute amount, but it will ease some pain and things like that. Mm-hmm. If the kid gets hurt bad, then yeah, they'll take them to a doctor. But there are some people that are so far are such devout believers, either through circumstances like they just happen to give something and the kid gets over a cold. You know, uh, it's all a matter of kind of their perspective and. Especially on a young child, it's almost a clever Hans effect. Right. When the parents think they're doing good, the kid, you know, and they're happy, the kid's going to react uh, in a positive explain manner. It, even if he you feels should like explain the, the, clever, the clever Hans story for people who haven't heard it before. Can you hear Paul? Yeah, explain clever Hans. Can you hear me, James? I think he's. we're losing his audio. Uh Okay. Well, when James comes back, we'll. Uh, Clever Hans was a yeah, um, trick horse, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, trained to count. And so people would would assume that Clever Hans had figured out the count rather than just had been automatically responding to it. To well, uh, he, he he had a handler that worked very closely with him, and if you've ever seen. Um, newsreels footage of Clever Hans. The guy stands right in front of the horse as the horse taps his hoof on the ground. And the whole time the, the, the guy standing in front is using his body language uh, to, to encourage mm-hmm. the horse to go on or, dis- or encourage the horse to stop. So, uh, you know, if, if you really want to believe in something like that, you can find a way well, to believe in it. it but it's, if it's, 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 it's a magic trick, right? I mean, it's, it's like lots of other magic tricks. There's, there's a... Well, it's not of... even a very it's not even a very good magic trick. No. It's pretty transparent to somebody who doesn't it's want an, to believe. But you know it's when an animal make, training trick. Yeah. yeah. When people make a well, slogan. Funny thing was. I'll oh, go ahead, Nick. I was just going to say when people make a slogan of the the X Files thing, I want to believe, and they present it, you know, like a manifesto. You know, you you you've got a problem right there at the get go. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. The the funny thing on the uh, clever Hans was that. The horse was tested repeatedly, but the 
people who were testing him were standing in the same way as a handler, and they would still have tells that the horse, I mean, the, the horse was intelligent. I'm not going to deny that, the fact that he could read human body language like that. But they would react, and the horse would do the same thing. You know, he'd start tapping his hoof down, and then once he got to that number, you can almost see him kind of stumble when they'd give some sort of a signal, and, you know, that hoof would just kind of stop. Uh, it wasn't until they put blinders on him that they found out what was going on. Right. Well, that that's kind of like the uh, uh, facilitated communication, right? Remember, uh, yeah, that's still going on. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're talking about the holding the arm of people who can't type, and, and but then people no who can't communicate fingers. really at all, uh, either people who are yeah. uh, have a very severe autism or some other kind of disease Comatose. where they, they can't they can't really communicate. Uh, people hold their hands and they and they think they're typing something on the keyboard, and it's actually the person holding the hand who's doing the the typing. And it wasn't until they did tests where the person holding the hand could not see what the cues that the autistic person, or whoever was seeing, was uh, mm-hmm. was seeing, that it just became random gibberish. Uh, a, a, te- a technological form of the Ouija board. That's all it is. It's similar to the Ouija board, yeah. uh, except that with the Ouija board, you kind of just, you know, every, three or four people are moving their hands around. You know, and this here is one person guiding a hand to, on the keyboard. Uh, yeah, it's similar to that. It's not really the automotor effect, I don't believe. It's more deliberate. Uh, it's more complicated manipulation form form of self deception, uh, and there was a a court case quite recently where um, a very sordid situation where a lady who was a college professor convinced herself that some this man who um, had a very severe disease it wasn't autism but it's some other disease I believe it was. Uh, cerebral palsy, who could not communicate, uh, was telling her that he loved her, and he who wanted that that he was attracted to her, and she got this through the facilitated communication that she was doing, and she had sex with this guy, who was not capable of. Sorry, James. <laughs> who was not capable of either refusing or accepting her overtures, right? And, oh. and she was actually convicted of, of raping him. Uh, and the judge was very severe in his judgment on her because she should have known that he really couldn't consent to sex one way or the other. And uh, so it was, you know, it was a very sad situation um and uh he you know he just was not capable of of letting her know how he thought about that and she was convinced that he he loved her it was that was she actually fooled herself she was basically telling Mm -hmm. herself that that's yes and, I had no idea yeah. that kind of facilitated communication was still going on because it rocketed up as a big story so quickly and it crashed down to earth almost as quickly. I, I thought that was <laughs> too passe to people to still be deceiving themselves to that degree. No, apparently that subculture did, well, they, not, did not completely disappear like I thought it would. They've just gone more technological now because it used to be, you know, they held the person's hand with a pencil wedged in there and they would move the pencil across a piece of paper. Now... Like Paul was saying, they're using keyboards. Yeah, well, before that, right, there was the there was the recovered memories and the satanic oh, ritual yeah, abuse. Yeah, satanic panic. And yeah, I lived in Arizona at that point. I, that I, think was, have, I think you have to distinguish between recovered memory. I mean, there's, there's, there's certainly in both cases, people are reading stuff into ambiguous deliverances, but when you, with recovered memory, it's it's much more of a, 
uh, rather than two people sitting in a room and one person facilitating the hand of another to write, you've got a whole community that converges on a particular narrative, and you know the people people borrow their narratives from the community, and the people who interpret the narratives they 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 get it from a community. So you've got you've got a lot of social interaction. You know this is what happened with the the, the Salem witch trials. You know, yeah, and and all throughout the witch craze in the early modern period in, in European history, many people looked at the. The, the 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 testimony given to witch finders and they said well this has got to be true look at they're all the same i mean it's just like what you hear in ufo reports today well you know, could millions of people could they be saying the same thing if they hadn't authentically each seen it but you know they're just they're just channeling what what's available out there in the culture and well it's well, not- well it's a, the satanic ritual abuse and the and the ufo abductions are very similar in their origins mm-hmm. uh and uh this except the satanic ritual abuse seems to have largely passed out of out of our culture and uh UFO abductions I think are on their way out now but uh the the the, uh, the similarity to facilitated communication is there is a facilitator and then there's a person who's more or less passive who kind of just is in my view the victim of of the of the facilitator uh who uh, is given these memories that they never had before, and they end up change. It changes them. It makes them a different person because they now believe that either they were abused as a child or they were abducted by Greys and and sexually abused inside a spaceship, which is pretty similar uh, to being abused by a Satanist. And uh, in, my, in my view, it's still it's still a victim. They're the victim. There, there's someone who uh, the therapist, so to speak, who was actually quite often a uh, uh, it's just somebody who was out to make a quick buck would convince them that they needed many, many more sessions to get to the root of of their abuse or their or their uh, alien abduction, or even if they were out to make a quick buck, it was still, yeah, that narrative had to be reinforced somehow. And uh, so you have the late Bud Hopkins, who was famous for, uh, his uh, background, he was an artist. He had no training in psychology or psychiatry. And he was hypnotizing people and recovering these memories of of alien abduction. And now we have uh he's he's he died a few years ago, but um we have now um David Jacobs, who is a history professor. He, he calls himself Dr. Jacob Jacobs, but his doctorate is in history. And he hypnotizes people and convinces them they have hybrid babies, alien hybrid babies. Uh <laughs> and he believes that these alien human hybrids are all over all over the place. I don't think he makes a lot of money doing that, but I I think it does make him the center of that whole narrative, that whole subculture. And I think that's where he gets his he derives his his uh reward from that. I was going to say do you think he's running a long con on this or do you think he actually believes it? Oh, I, I, he, he believes his own bullshit, uh, as many people do. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you never a, know. A lot, if a lot of the people really are true believers, and they're not in it for money. You can you can spot the difference usually. But, I mean, well, uh, it's not that they don't care about the money. It's just that the cognitive dissonance is probably, you know, there, there, there are five fundamental forces in nature, right? Strong force, weak force, electromagnetic force, gravity, and cognitive dissonance. And of these, cognitive dissonance is the most powerful. And uh, so people want to believe that they're, at heart, good people, that they're helping people. So they will believe enough of the narrative to let themselves believe that they are actually uh, good guys, even though they're raking in the cash. And I think the faith healers are like that, too. Uh, yeah, they're they're fun. 
you can mess with them kind of easy too at times. Yeah, I mean the <laughs> people like um, who's our favorite faith healer, Benny Hinn. Uh, yeah, or Creflo Dollar. Oh yeah, Creflo Dollar. Uh, who's the one that James Randi? Well, Peter got Popoff. Years who's still, who's, yeah, Popoff. Who's, and he's he's back with a debt debt relieving holy water. <laughs> hey, <laughs> <laughs> can he pay off my mortgage with his holy water? I, I'll uh, no. Uh, uh, yeah, Popoff is one of those unsinkable rubber ducks, right? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I, they all have the same act. I love it. They, you know, they get up on the stage and it's basically. Give unto me and ye shall receive. I mean, they all have the same bit. But you know, I think even even Popoff kind of believes what he's saying. He may not believe every every detail, but I think he believes uh, that well, he's somehow helping people. You know. Yeah. Well, which is scarier, the con man who knows he's in there in it for the money, or the person who actually thinks it works? Well. I think that's part of the sell, right? Is you is you believe this person believes what he's saying, right? And, and mm. either he's a he's a great con man, or he really is. Uh, he really does kind of believe it, and he really and the way he can sleep at night is that he thinks he's somehow helping people. Well, that and the big pile of money under the bed. Well, yeah, but I mean. <laughs> One of the stories I read about uh, Benny Hinn was how he would leave the healing service and get out and get into his Mercedes limousine and drive off, right? Uh, the man had an enormous amount of money. Wasn't he the one asking for donations to buy a jet? I can't remember who that was. Uh, Do- that was Creflo Dollar. Uh, that was Creflo. Uh, yeah. Because you've got to have your own like- private jet to uh, to serve the Lord. <laughs> Okay, if, you, if you're running a nonprofit, it's just like with the BFRO and Matt Moneymaker and Creflo Dollar. Don't you think you they would change their last names? <laughs> <laughs> really, they're just kind of hinting at what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like we can get away with anything. I think there are some people who kind of really do, you know, just like a like a carnival barker. They know that they're selling that they're raking in the money at the expense of gullibility. And I think the way they yeah. sleep at night is they figure that these people are so gullible they deserve to be taken for their money. I, I got an issue with, I mean, sometimes the easiest thing to do is just let somebody learn a lesson by you know getting fleeced like that. But the fact that these people keep going back and back and back to them, sending them thousands of dollars over, you know, two or three decades. Well, you know, that's disgusting. Yeah. You know, my mother, uh, you know, may she rest in peace was, um, for a a while, not, not forever, but for a while, she was a devotee of Jim and Tammy Faye. She even bought Tammy Faye's horrible album, (laughs) which, Uh. which, which is, you know, if, if you want, if you want a candidate the cat- for the, wor- the worst album ever recorded. <laughs> that, that's the one that sounds like a sobbing cat screeching, isn't it? Oh, well, well, they they drowned her out with, you know, with the band, you know, so you could really couldn't hear her very well. But, <laughs> yeah, she could, basically couldn't sing at all. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, Ugh, like, what, you know, I can't like either, me, but I don't, I don't record albums. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. but. T- Tammy Faye uh, and Jim were, of course, they were classic con artists. And they got away with it for a long time. But my mother was very disappointed when she learned the truth and she, you know, she uh, stopped sending them donations. Uh, and so, and my mother was not a stupid person. She was just a very trusting person. And uh, yeah. that's, that's kind why of, they, that's why they call them con artists because they have to gain your confidence. Right. And people who are trusting have confidence that they, that they place in con artists. Well, people want to place confidence in people. They want to trust people. 
they, they kind of need to have that comfort zone where there's somebody I can trust. And that's true. So, uh, yeah, maybe getting back, you know, going back to, uh, you know, the uh, natural uh, remedies, there was a, there was a Nova that got into these natural remedies and, uh, there, they had this couple that ran up, ran the company and I, I wish I could remember why, because they were, I, I think kind of the deal is that they would buy these pills out of China. They would be made overseas. Um, I think mostly comes out of these natural uh, remedies come out of China. And they would just prep, put them in packages and, and sell them in the States. And people were dying. Um, there was, uh, I forget what the pill was, but it was, it was destroying their livers. I mean, literally. The, oh. Well, it was. Uh. Something like maybe 30 people were, are, or that, that the, the liver is so damaged that, well, they, they either died or there's it's so damaged that they're not expected to live type of thing. Mm. Wasn't it echinacea? It, they, I think it was an echinacea or right. uh, saw palmetto. Something like that, but it was an ingredient because a lot of the stuff that comes out of China, uh, I used to get the FDA warnings about um, some of the uh, whatever company, you know, like uh, the male enhancement drugs, you know, natural male enhancement had uh, had Viagra in it. They would smiling mom, yeah, yeah, and um, so they were you know being called out for it, but it's like um, but these people like uh, they believe that. You know, they, they their product wasn't doing or shouldn't have done any harm, uh, and they were they were, I think, because uh, I think it was the the supply chain that uh, whatever added uh, whatever that you know did this and this it, I mean, there's though you know, it, it I I read about these stories all the time. I mean, there there there's the religious types who have uh, they torture their kids, you know, when they have you know like. Um, I think there's, I mean, there's stories about, them, um, you know, uh, uh, appendicitis. They would, uh, you know, do whatever, um, you know, stuff that's really easy to treat. They won't, they'll, you know, they'll pray and that type of thing to heal the kid. And then there's those who will pump the kids with maple syrup or whatever, uh, whatever some uh, naturopath or homeopath or whatever tells them, hey, this, you, you, Use this, and this should work. This will work, and it's it's really the same story over and over again. It, at least as far as you know, these kids are are being injured or being killed by their parents because they're tr- they're they're not tr- they're trusting these people who have. I, I sometimes I think they just they don't really care. They just want to try to sell you the you know a hundred dollar you know uh, jar of. Uh, you know, whatever route that they dug up out of their backyard. And uh, uh, I know that there's a lot of, you know, and then the, the FDA, hit, they, they catch them. They, I mean, there's, um, I mean, I'm, I was seeing like quite a few of these reports about, you know, this drug had, you know, this natural thing had a, you know, a blood thinner in it, or it had a, I mean, they had really like real mm-hmm. serious stuff in it. And so then they shut them down. But of course, by the time you can catch up with whoever did it, they've closed shop, moved next door, and set up a new shop and producing something else. Um, and some of them had peanut in them, and some of them had other allergens. Yeah. And yeah. So well, you know, and, yeah, and, yeah. and it, it's it is really. Um, I mean, every time I read these stories, and I, I I've been seeing that um, that maple syrup story, I'm like, you know, I'm, I. I I really do want to. I wish I could reach through the computer and slap these people and say, "This is this. You're stupid." <laughs> I really do. I mean, it's just like, come on, you know, it, you know. Um, I mean, I, I kind of, I, I, I love. I, I, I've heard, I've heard the argument that God, you know, when they, especially like the, like the, I think the Jehovah Witnesses are the ones that are big on no uh, uh, blood transfusions, but they. Uh, or is it the mm-hmm. Christian scientists? There, no, the Jehovah's the Witness. You're right. Jehovah's yeah. Witnesses say no transfusions. Uh, Christian yeah. scientists, uh, Christian. at least the old school ones, were like no medical treatment at all. Right. Uh, but, so, and then 
Mennonites and a few other sects are the same way. Yeah, and they use and they claim that God is supposed to be the one that does you know does this thing. And I go, you know what? You know, uh, if you want to if you want to believe in a God, I mean, I don't. But you know, uh, if you're going to believe in a God, God created doctors. They create. He created these vaccines. He created the the the, the stuff. This isn't something that is not God created. If if you want to make that argument, and uh, you know, maybe, well, they, you know, uh, I should point out most most of the deep religious people I know, which include the majority of my family, uh, uh, do take full advantage of modern medicine. Uh, exactly, but I mean, uh, there's a few extremists who who don't. Right. In fact, I, I think mean, I think most Christian scientists do as well. I I wouldn't I don't want to paint Tari one of the same brush. Yeah, I wouldn't want to either. But you know, but it but it is there. There are those who they, you know, um, you know, God's going to do this. You know, and no, there, like, there, there well, are well, people on principle on principle who 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 refuse medical treatment and and like Paul said earlier, some people need to believe. Uh, some people need to believe in a con man. Some people need to believe that if they can pray somebody to wellness and they don't have to go to a doctor. Yeah. Right. Or, or there's those who, uh, you know, that when, when the case gets hopeless, they'll, that's all they have to, to, uh, lean on because medicine can't solve every problem. Uh, we're all going to die some sooner or later mm-hmm. and medicine can't stop that. It Ray can maybe well delay it, but it can't stop it. <laughs> uh, now, that, I wanted to bring up something that I read today, by the way, uh, along these same lines, uh, by Stephen Novella, who we, whose name we took in vain a few episodes ago uh, when his brother was on. Uh, yeah. Steve, still Stephen. Knows, uh, still owes us a shout out. There, there was, uh, he wrote, I think it was today, uh, yeah, March 18th. Uh, I cannot pronounce this fellow's name properly. Ionidas. Evidence-based medicine has been hijacked. Uh, John Ionidas is the one who published a few years ago that most medical studies are uh, are wrong, and uh, based on some statistical arguments. And he's he's followed up on that, uh, and he he says that evidence-based medicine. Uh, has been hijacked by people who's in whose best interest it is to have their particular uh, therapy adopted, uh, or by academics whose job it is to get more grant money. Um, I recommend reading uh, Stephen Novell's article because it 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 said this is not license to adopt any arbitrary alternative medical treatment. Uh, but we do need to get better at, at what he calls science-based medicine, which is not the same thing as evidence-based medicine. Uh, science-based medicine takes a much more rigorous approach to determining which treatments uh, should become the standard of care. And it's... Uh, it's a tough thing uh, because a lot of doctors don't really have the time to get behind doing science. They go with whatever is published as the best approach and uh, or with their experience. And they, and certainly and they, they will, every case is different and they will encounter cases in their in their practice that that there's no published literature for or the published literature simply doesn't apply strongly enough to the particular patient's needs so they have to make judgment calls and it's it's a tough thing to i mean we don't want to i don't want to judge doctors too harshly for sometimes going with their gut feel because that may be sometimes all they have to to work with but uh, I recommend. I'm going to put this article in the show notes. I recommend you read it. It's more nuanced than I can possibly uh, provide here at this point. But uh, but can we can we fairly call that you know is that non evidence based medicine medicine you know is, well it's based it if it's based on on experience uh, which tends to be biased 
uh, right? I mean, anecdotal. All, all experience is anecdotal. But uh, if you've got a base, but the thing is, if you've got a background in scientific medicine, you're not. Your intuitions are not at the same level as someone who has no background in scientific medicine and you, they say, oh, well, let's bleed the patient. That might help. <laughs> but, you know, a doctor who is trained in scientific medicine, they know that they know the range of options. They know how, how, how symptoms manifest and present. And they're going to have a, a basic background of what, what works and what not, what doesn't work. Well, you know, uh, let, let me give you one of the best experiences I've had, I've had recently. Um, I have issues with blood pressure. And I was, uh, I went to my doctor. He's no longer my doctor, by the way. Um, and <laughs> she took my blood pressure and said, your blood pressure is really high. I'm going to, I want you to go check into the emergency room. And so I, I dutifully checked into the emergency room and this was at uh, Washington and Venice hospital, uh, which is in Tacoma park, Maryland. And the doctor there was one of the most reasonable people I've dealt with in the medical profession. And he, he said, well, okay, we're going to give you a, a couple of medicines to take. But really, the literature, there's nothing in the literature that I have ever read that says that bringing your blood pressure down quickly is beneficial. So we need to bring it down slowly, and here's the things you need to do to bring it down. And I said, thank you <laughs> for you know, for telling me what the literature actually says, instead of just, you know, I'm, I'm the doctor, believe me what I, believe me what I say, cause I'm the doctor, you know? Uh, and he says, of course, this was a young doctor who probably had some of the latest training, but, uh, still I, I was, I was floored that he was so forthright with me about here's what the evidence, you know, we don't have any evidence that says that, that what you're, physician told you was necessary that bring your blood pressure down as rapidly as possible. Uh, we'll bring it down slowly. And, and that did, that is what happened. But, uh, so instead of checking me in and, and charging my insurance company thousands of dollars for nothing, he sent me home. And good for, good for him. I'm glad he did. You know, with, uh, with a, a bottle of, of, of pills that, you know, would help bring it down slowly. But he said, you know, go see your doctor, get, make sure you have the right cocktail of drugs and, and do the following things to bring your blood pressure down. And yeah, it is a risk to have high blood pressure, but it's not, there's no benefit to bring it, you know, to crashing it down quickly. So, uh, and now that, that's simply, you know, I, I wish I could say every doctor I've talked to has been like that, but it's not not the case. Uh, but and, would you would you say that is not an example of evidence based medicine? I, I I can't see that, but you know maybe. No, well, no, I think it's a, an example of science based medicine. Uh, and uh, but the other doctor was just sort of responding to her training that oh my god, high blood pressure bad. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, lots of intervention required right away, which, um, uh, without really looking into the literature, without really looking at, at what, what the, what the, what the science says. And so I, anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to recommend that people read, uh, Dr. Novella's article to, because like I said, it's more nuanced than I can possibly provide for you about, Balancing between evidence-based medicine, which is – he basically agrees it has been hijacked. Uh, Science-based medicine, which is something that's a different movement, and then all the cranks and kooks and, and, uh, and pseudoscientists out there who have been exploiting the fact that evidence-based medicine has problems and – have been stepping into that breach and saying, Hey, you know, come take my miracle remedy. <laughs> my, my, it, it, my one, my one, uh, trick. <laughs> yeah. <Clickbait>. Actually, <laughs> now that, that you mentioned it, there is a really, uh, 
Dr. Mark Chrislip does uh, a number of podcasts. He also writes for Science Based Medicine. Yes, and I just put, I just put a link for you for the to put in the show notes for his uh, Persif- Persiflager's Infectious Disease Puscast. He goes through the he, go, <laughs> he goes through the, the the medical literature and uh, actually reads the reads the literature and gives his. Uh, opinion or whatever i don't know if he gives an opinion but he just says here's what the here's what the the thing says and i i like listening to it i actually haven't listened to it the in a while. Cast, yeah. Puscast, yeah <laughs> puscast mm-hmm. he does uh, he did quack cast too yeah he does the quack cast and i think he does one other i know but i know he also writes for science-based medicine so you'll when you look at uh bomb or steve novella's article you might spot a chrislip article in there too yeah i guess he's really it's really good. Puscast really like uh, mainly focuses on infectious diseases. Uh, I understand it. Yeah, it which is. are important. Uh, but but he, he actually goes through the literature. Uh, there's a lot of I, I I've come across neat stuff in there about uh, oh the uh, wearing the uh, masks, uh, whether you wear the surgical mask or the uh, you know, like a dust mask, like you'd buy in a hardware store. Versus mm-hmm. there's also one I think. I think it's a medical one, but it's like it's like a combination. I think it has like a valve on the front of it, but it's like a was it something one hundred five or whatever it is. I he, he was talking about that and and the effect of the efficacy of, the, of those. So yeah. and basically saying that you're probably the the, the one that was uh, the one hundred five. I again I I'm I'm probably totally messing that up, but the surgical mask. Yeah. Or, or a dust mask will not prevent you catching a virus or something in oh. when you're in, in crowds. Well, you know, in biological a, respirator. Yeah, in, yeah. in Asia, uh, it's considered rude to not wear a mask if you have a cold. Uh, right. So if you if but you ha- if you have a if you have a upper respiratory infection, uh, yeah. you're supposed to wear a mask in public. Yeah. Uh, but the ma- I see the just, mask. Just, it's the- just a matter of a politeness. It's not. They yeah. don't really question whether it's going to help or not. Yeah. Uh, well, I see some of them, and yeah, those don't. The ones that I, a lot of them I see don't work, but it it is. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a culture thing, so I'm not gonna. I won't question that, but it's just definitely. Um, if you're if you're thinking of you know anthrax scare, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, one, one thing I really like about Japan is that good manners are very important there. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, 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 I'm not used to it, but I could get used to it. <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean that they like you. It just means that they're going to treat you with civility. But yeah. Paul, Paul Theroux said that the, in one of his travel books that the Japanese have perfected good manners and made them indistinguishable from rudeness. <laughs> well, I mean, it doesn't mean, yeah, it doesn't mean that they're going to be not, that they're really going to be friends with you. It just means that now, now you go to the Arab world and people want to, and people will, uh, always constantly wondering, are you going to be my friend or not? You know, uh, would you like to be friends and let's have, let's have a, a, a glass of tea and talk and talk and maybe we'll be friends and then we can do business, right? <laughs> but not until we've become well, friends. Uh, but well, anything in the Arab world is if you're a guest in our house, you're under their protection from anything. Oh yeah. Yeah. If they take it seriously. Uh, but, and of course they'll make you the best mint tea you ever had. Uh, and then you, you sit down and you, and you talk about, uh, you make small talk for a while before you get to any kind of serious business decision. Uh, and you have to be, you have, they have to be able to, you're your friend. Whereas in Japan, they will treat you with tremendous civility and courtesy, but they won't pretend to be your friend. <laughs> uh, so, but I, I kind of like that civil society. I mean, in Japan, uh, at the airport, uh, on the escalator, everybody who who doesn't want to walk up the escalator moves over to the left. And everybody who wants to, who's in a hurry, can go to the right. Where in, and not, not not just in the airport, in every busy, crowded train station in the country, yeah. even Sh- even Shinjuku, which is the busiest railway station in the world, according to Wikipedia, people will stand on the left to stand, and people will walk up on the right side. Yeah, and if so, if you're late to your flight, you can zip up the escalator, 
and you're not standing behind some guy with five bags dropped on the escalator, you know. Well, if you are, you're standing behind a Westerner, not a Japanese. Yeah, it's 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 invariably an American. Uh, uh, try that in a U.S. airport; you won't get anywhere. You'll you're you're stuck on the escalator till it gets to the top, and uh, it, you know I I like that. I like I like that. Uh, I I can get used to that really easily. Um, I think maybe we uh, Americans we we tend to have a poor perspective on how we treat each other. Yeah, well, the political culture has become vulgar and abrasive, and that's uh, is that reflecting the popular culture or is the popular culture reflecting the political culture? I'm not sure. I think there's there's it, multiple it, feedback loops difficult. working there. Yeah, multiple feedbacks loop. <laughs> mm -hmm. Goes both ways because. The politicians react to what the people want, and then the people are getting what they want, so they want more of it. And now you've got basically politicians in their crowds calling for blood. Yeah, it it, and it, that should result in like everybody walking out, but instead they cheer. <laughs> That's. Uh, well, there's there's a reason human beings once organized gladiatorial combats on a very large scale. You know, that people people love that kind of thing. Yeah, I can see a certain politician at some point putting on a laurel crown, sitting on a throne, and just giving the thumbs down to people. <laughs> speaking that, of that's giving, almost a best case scenario. <laughs> speaking of <laughs> speaking of giving the thumbs down to people, I'd like to mention that the the Stephen novella you've been talking about earlier is the same Stephen novella who publicly defended the deplatforming of Richard Dawkins at a major conference, and uh, um, well, they, they by the way, but they they have they have retracted that by the way. <laughs> but the if you've read the blog post, they've they've made the. Sam Harris called it one of the major episodes of douchebaggery in our time. <laughs> and they yeah. certainly made themselves look like idiots. Well, Even if they've retracted it, you can't take back what you've said. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I know, but I, I think uh, he had very mixed, Mavella himself had very mixed feelings about that. Uh, but he, he defended yeah. it. Yeah, and his, yes. his blog post defending the deplatforming is still available. Yes. I, I, I think it was partly because he was one of the members on that council is it, it's a council that decided it it's not just steve novella or the novella clan that decided it but i think just kind of like a lot of other people just to toe the party line he had to see the rationale behind it yeah and that, just defended it because that was what nef uh, that's what the nexus committee had decided <laughs> after a couple of his comments and they called they called dawkins up and told him that he was invited back, and then he had a stroke about it an hour later. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Remember, you know, the, the psychology James was just describing of, of, of this group think of going along and justifying. You're talking about a group of people who identify themselves as skeptics. I mean, that's not a, the behavior of somebody who's skeptical. You don't go along with the, what the we're, group we're says not a, and find a rational We're not immune to it. it. We're, yeah. we're human, though. We're not immune to that. Well, we if have I, our own biases. If I had been sitting on that council, I would, I would have walked out. I mean, I'm not going to be swayed by that kind of garbage. Yeah. Well, they, he said on SGU that you know some of the people were against disinviting him, some of the people were for it, and so that's why the invitation waffled on it, why they disinvited him and then turned around and invited him back as part of a panel. Oh, in my a opinion, bunch of people on there. And he he has said that he was delighted with that that reinvite reinvitation. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Even though he's not going to be able yeah. to 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 go because of his illness, but uh, Steve Stevens uh, Novella has known Dawkins for a long time. Yeah. And they're basically intellectual allies, but I think that you know Dawkins Dawkins can be a bit of a loose cannon sometimes. Mm -hmm. Uh. He almost seems well, to take a certain amount of pleasure in trolling people. He, he does. He does. He's, he's, he's pretty rough on people, and uh, that, that's the intellectual equivalent of tough love. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and he apologized. You know, he's apologized a couple times for some of those things, but um, it's, it's uh, you know, 
we like we talked with Bob Novella, there there's all this drama. People seem to want to tear the skeptical community apart and, and the people that want to do that are the skeptics themselves. And uh well, they're, they're there because they're kind, of the kind of people who ask questions. And it would be unreasonable to expect a community of that kind to have consensus. So the very idea of having a meeting that arises at a consensus about the skeptics seems pretty bizarre to me. I, I think you're well, right about that. I think that, yeah. Well, and, and the, But yet there are some people who have this need to feel this, you know, ideological unity. They, uh, want, they want a group. They want to enjoy the, the, yeah. the feels of an in-group. <laughs> That's they they want is. the community. They want the community that they're lacking because they don't exactly. have a church. Well, they don't have exactly. They want like the community. That. There is but the there is no is in if there is no outside, right? Yeah, that part of the. As, part I, of the I think I'm is, quoting think Peter was, Gabriel badly there, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I think Novella said one time, trying to organize skeptics is like trying to herd cats. <laughs> yeah, well, that would be <laughs> easier well actually. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, Mike, uh, did you have a topic you wanted to bring up? Other than what we already talked about? Uh, actually, uh, I think Patrick Festa's in our Q&A asking questions. Yeah, he is. Uh, I saw, I've oh, seen that. Okay. Do we need to uh, take care of that? popping over to that right quick. He's asking about the novella thing and several other questions here. Okay. What is this novella thing? Oh, okay. Well, it's there's, several, there's several it's novellas. A very, it's a very short, Patrick, it's a very short book. <laughs> no, no, he's just <laughs> teasing you, Patrick. Uh, well, if we're talking about Stephen Novella specifically. Uh, not the Bob Novella, we, who's his brother, we had on the, uh, on the show he's, recently. He's the oldest one. He's the oldest brother. He's the best known of the brothers. He's a professor of medicine at Yale. Uh, he's very well known for his science medicine and neurological blogs. And he's also one of the leaders of the New England Skeptical Society. And he was among the people who invited and then disinvited Richard Dawkins to their annual conference uh, and then re-invited him. Uh, and then Richard Dawkins, shortly after he hung up the phone from getting reinvited had a stroke and uh so he's he's under medical supervision and can't travel um he's also richard dawkins as you know is best known for being married to lala ward who played one of the doctor's assistants on doctor who <laughs> actually she was married to the fourth doctor she was married b briefly married to tom baker which uh <laughs> yeah no he's he's the sixth doctor isn't he and do you know do you know who introduced yeah. do, introduced Richard Dawkins and Lala Ward to each other? Uh, no, Douglas Adams. It should be <laughs> <laughs> Douglas a, Adam, Adams used to work on on Doctor Who, and he knew Lala Ward from that. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you listen to those old Lala, Lala Ward Doctor Who episodes, you will recognize Douglas Adams all over those scripts. <laughs> you know the joke. All the jokes are Douglas Adams jokes. You can tell. That, that he was taking straight <laughs> straight scripts from the various writers they worked with, and adding jokes to them, because uh, there were no jokes in any of the script. They were they were all pretty dull scripts. And he was, and uh, he was a script editor, and he so he knew Lala Ward well from the, from that. And uh, she was a single at the time, and he introduced uh, introduced her to his friend Richard Dawkins, and. Uh, so that was Dawkins' third marriage, her second, I believe. Uh, and they're still married to this day. In fact, she uh, was a co-narrator of the God Delusion audiobook, if you have if you ever listened to that. so uh, hmm. Indeed, I did listen to it. And uh, so, she, you know, she's a professional, so she does, does a fine job. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, that that's kind of an interesting aside there. I, I to me, being married to Lala Ward would be a life achievement that you don't need to add to. <laughs> but uh, uh, he's written a couple other books too. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm sorry, Mike. I did you have a train of thought I was I was busting into? 
Well, I was, first, I want to make sure we took care of our Q&A. Uh, yeah. Can we take care of our listeners? we got to take care of those folks. Christian Sign- <laughs> okay, Patrick well, they're, says... They're paying our, they're paying our, uh, our expenses here. So let's, uh, Pat, Patrick, says, uh, Patrick uh, said Trump, so I guess he's a Trump supporter. Uh, <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> now, um, it's, uh, he, he, he's going to help fund my Kickstarter to have Trump as the first man on Mars. <laughs> before we develop the space suits. I think, was, I think actually, I think Trump should be the first man on the sun, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> just step out there, Donald. No, see, because, see how the weather is. I understand go, it's warm no, out here. Go at his, night. It's cooler. His ego, <laughs> <laughs> his ego is so big that when it burst, it'd blow the sun out like a candle. <laughs> just him and his good brain. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> No, it'd be all that hot air coming out of his head and his ass and every other orifice. Okay. Uh, so I I should shut up and let you guys talk. Uh, no, I, <laughs> I'm good. But uh, I'm, yeah, my, my little story is actually um, um, it's about uh, a fossil that has just finally got classified. And it's, it's an interesting – it's locally – or it, it's – Commonly referred to as the Tully Monster, it was uh, discovered in Illinois. I mean, actually, literally uh, just down the street, about ten miles from me. Um, this little uh, this little creature. It's only it was only uh, uh, was it fifteen centimeters long? Uh, but it looks from if you there'll be a link. I, I gave a I gave Paul the link. You look at this thing, and it kind of looks like a demonic. Uh, uh, goose. I think that's what that uh, Paul had. Uh, <laughs> a well, goose maybe, from hell, yeah. A go- goose from hell. The underwater but, goose from hell. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 this neat little creature. It, it and for the past almost sixty years, they hadn't they couldn't classify it. They couldn't figure out what it what it was. And I guess finally they uh, decided it's uh, uh, kind of it's related to the lamprey. Or lampreys, uh, kind of. It's an. It's a. For the uh, listeners that are listening to it now, this is. It's a little creature. Yeah, about fifteen centimeters long. It's kind of. Um, kind of looks kind of like a squid with just one tentacle coming out of the, the end with a with like teeth at the end, and then like a little there's a little fiber, uh, appendage on the back. Which uh, there's in the article it says eyes. I I remember reading stuff on it that it might have been ears, but uh, hmm. that's how it sees and uh, has gills. Um, and it swims. Uh, it swims similar to a uh, cuttlefish. You know, I was gonna and, say it looks a bit like a cuttlefish. Yeah. But um, yeah, this has been kind of like a local, like a. a, a, a for me, it's a local legend. It's uh, uh, kids have been uh, wanting to find this thing. I mean, I've done a number of uh, fossil hunts because uh, uh, to most most of the rock uh, area is uh, like Cambrian to uh, I think it's Devonian, just right, real local. So there's the you know the hmm. you know trilobites and always finding stuff like that corals i've got a small collection of uh fossilized coral um but everyone's been wanting to find these things and it's only it, it's only been found in illinois it's the illinois state uh, fossil so it's oh. kind of nice so it's kind of nice to see this thing finally given a classification in the uh the tree so that that's what was neat about this article and i just saw it this morning so yeah uh, it's a strange looking creature you got to you got to See the picture. Uh, we'll have a link <laughs> in the show notes. Um, yeah. Okay. That's well, why things like that are why we don't need to invent monsters. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> we we elect them to office all the time, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> or anyway, uh, don't get me started. Uh, That's a pretty cool looking. Uh, by the way, I, I I was I was just kidding, Patrick. He he thinks uh, Trump is an ass. Uh, so, which I think is 
too kind. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> uh, Nick, do you have anything else you do? Anything you wanted to bring up? And you haven't really had your own topic yet. I would like to mention a recent paper that appeared on Archive. I can't remember uh, who brought my attention to it. Uh, willingness to pay for basic research, a contingent valuation experiment on the Large Hadron Collider by Gelsomnia Catalano, Massimo Florio, and Francesco Giffone, where they make a real effort to try to uh, analyze willingness to pay, which they abbreviate as WTP, uh, in, in, um, for, for, for big science, which is, of course, increasingly expensive. And, and it, it, a, a large scientific instrument today can consume billions of dollars and require decades to uh, build, as in the case of the LHC. And uh, interestingly, here in the concluding paragraphs, let me see if I can find the section. Uh, Recur quote, recurring to the concept of existence value in analogy with environmental and cultural economics allows us to propose a direct empirical analysis of the non-use value of science for the general public, unquote. So in other words, they're, they're suggesting that besides making a cost-benefit analysis of science, we can, we can treat it like a, a, an environment that's worthy of being saved or a cultural treasure is worthy to be saved and analyze these by uh, more or less conventional economic means. So I think it's great that the authors are are making an, an attempt to to view science through more than a reductive lens of of cost benefit analysis. I I don't think this is the final word. I think this is the beginning of of of, of a more um, sophisticated understanding of the relation of science to what I would call scientific civilization. Uh, and that's something I talked about in the recent Wow Signal Burst, which you Paul just put up on your Wow Signal podcast, in which I talked about the, the funding opportunities for science, what kind of science can can inspire people. But I think there's often a, a disconnect between the public interest in science, which can be quite high, and the translation of that into, you know, the the the, the nitty gritty of politics, which is voting, savers, funding and and the, the redistribution of income through taxation. Uh, because as I pointed out in my wow signal burst, even though people have a very high level of interest in, in science, and you can see that from the public response to, uh, you know, major scientific discoveries like recently gravity waves and the Higgs boson, it usually doesn't make its way to through to the voting patterns. So uh, elected representatives may have absolutely no idea of how uh, interested their constituents may be in science. And I, I think that's a, a serious problem for, for a society that is both democratic and scientific. But isn't that why we have things like the National Science Foundation who kind of give us one level of insulation between the political process and the Science funding process. I mean, or NASA, for example. I mean, NASA's yes. fu funding priorities are are somewhat set by Congress, but also uh, within NASA. So I've, there, there's kind of a back and forth there that goes on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are definitely there. Or are the NIH. And... The NIH has a large amount of money, which they they give out in grants, which they do not they do not need congressional approval for each grant. They uh, they're just given this big chunk of billions of dollars and say, spend it wisely on improving health, right? So that... that... In, in the big picture, though, I agree with you on that, but I think in the big picture, if you look at the dialogue surrounding science in our civilization, it's still treated as a, as a marginal undertaking and scientists asking for a larger collider to be built or a new radio telescope to be built. It's, this, is, this is like this, you know, this, you know, get out, you know, this is a bother. We have real things. We have a war going on. We've got people who aren't fed. We've got, we don't have clean water in the city of Flint. You know, why in the world are you talking about this stuff? Um, you know, go away and come back on a quieter day and don't bug us with this kind well, of stuff. Well, right. I mean, th and, and if it were, they were asking for a high proportion of the budget. That might be a, a reasonable thing to say, right? But right, right. But the, 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 what I'm saying is that um, someday 
scientific civilization is either going to have to put up or shut up. And by that, I mean, it's going to have to have a budget commensurate with the size of our civilization and not be content with the tiny little amounts of money that are dolled out to science today or, or, or face a, a, a serious reversal of, of the progress we've been able to make because of science. Right. Well, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion lately about how to fix the whole process for applying for, uh, I mean, the whole funding process has gotten kind of corrupted. Uh, and within academia, it's more about bringing in the money than anything else. Uh, and uh, so there, there's a lot of, of soul searching going on right now about how we do this. And even within uh, organizations like NAH, and uh, who have a lot of money to give out, uh, and or National Science Foundation, uh, which gives out small, drolls out small amounts of money, or uh, private concerns like, say, the Breakthrough Initiative, which you mentioned in the in that recent Wow Signal burst, uh, where you have Yuri Milner who's spending a hundred million dollars of his own money, uh, which by Big science standards is not a lot of money. Uh, it's, it would not fund anything like the Large Hadron Collider, for example, but uh, it wouldn't even fund one experiment on the Large Hadron Collider. But you know, it will fund major radio telescope time for SETI, and that's the kind of thing that that uh, you know we have we have companies like Google who can actually fund more research, more pure research than the federal government can because they have great piles of cash that are not spoken for. <laughs> and uh, they, can make, they can make these kinds of small bets. And so why, that Google was looking into life extension. They're looking into med, you know, medicine. They're looking into things that have nothing to do with internet search per se or their, their basic business model. Uh, um, and, and other companies are doing that as well. And uh, yeah, several of the technology so-called unicorns that have you know huge amounts of cash on hand, Facebook as well, are in, investing in robots and all kinds of other technology. Yeah, and then also people make tons of money from something like something mundane like Amazon, and then invested in something cool like Blue Origin. So. Uh, <laughs> Or Elon Musk making money from PayPal and investing in SpaceX and yeah. Tesla. Yeah, I mean, PayPal was just his, just his, his step up into yeah, the major. Yeah, was, that was a, a step up the ladder, but it, he didn't really care about PayPal. He cared about Tesla and SpaceX and, and getting so to Mars on. and Hyperloop, which is actually now moving into uh, almost a, a prototype stage next, this year. Uh, so. You know, th there's a uh, there's a lot going on, and I think that you know we do have these multi tens of billions of dollars in cash for these big companies, and it's it's actually becoming hundreds of billions of dollars of cash for companies like Apple. Uh, Apple can't even spend all the money they have. Uh, <laughs> I wish they would let me spend it for them. <laughs> well, yeah, lots of people would say that, right? Uh, and uh, but of course they have fiduciary responsibilities to their shareholders, so they can't just spend it willy nilly. Google's a little more creative about the Google knows how to make small bets. I think a little bit more effectively. Uh, I think a lot of Google shareholders have no idea what their business is, so they <laughs> they just go ahead and let them do it. Uh, as long as the returns are coming in, yeah, I'm sure the returns do come in. That's that's the remarkable thing. I, uh, I have to admit, I was a Google skeptic, and I've sort of become a believer. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, science funding is – it's always going to be a messy process, right? It's never going to be clear and rational and and unified. It's always going to be lots of different interests grubbing for the billions, and some people go – some people grubbing for scraps – and, uh, you know, people like Pamela Gay who think $11 million is tons of money, and which for her it is, 
but you know that would not fund one day at the Large Hadron Collider. So uh, you know it depends on your perspective. Well, it might fund yeah. a day. I don't think it fund a week <laughs> at the Large Hadron Collider. The size of it depends on the size of instruments you need to do your science. So if you're a particle physicist or, or, or a radio astronomer, well, then it's expensive. But if you're, if you're a mathematician, you just need access to books and a blackboard. That's basically it. Right. Well, the, uh, yeah, it has to do, you know, as Laurie Anderson said many years ago, big science, hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> uh Gosh, I should play that song on the way out. I just don't have it to have it, haven't he? Uh, <laughs> by the way, if, if you don't know who Laurie Anderson is, you're, you're, too, you're too young. <laughs> uh, yeah. okay, we've got a couple of questions right quick, too. Okay. Uh, the first one was on Mike's Creature, wanting to know what period it was from. Yeah, it's a middle Pennsylvanian period. Okay. So it should be in the coal, the coal somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's where they found him near Coal City. Yeah, on the Masson yeah. Creek. Yeah, the 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 oh. science article that that uh, Mike linked to said uh, most of it's laid down three hundred and seven to three hundred nine million years ago. That sounds and about then, right. Yeah. So the uh, other question we've got is for Nick. I'm just going to read it as it's here. Do you think that out of those who don't care about science or for those who don't care that there is a need to try to reach, educate that public? No, absolutely. It's just a question of being sufficiently creative in your educational uh, efforts that, that uh, either people don't realize they're being educated or um, – you've reached them in a way that's something that they really care about. Uh, one of the things I was going to mention from this past week or from the past few months really is uh, the incredible success of Mike Mongo's book, uh, The Astronaut Instruction Manual, which he published late last year. And he's been getting a lot of attention and been interviewed and been appeared at a lot of events. And so he's reached an entire demographic of, you know, young, you know, preteen kids. Uh, he's, you know, calls himself an astronaut teacher and he's made multiple trips to Cuba and taught kids there uh, and, you know, telling kids, you know, it's okay to believe that you can be an astronaut. And, and so he's reached an important demographic that's obviously uh, the, of the future of a spacefaring civilization is going to be these kids. And you have to think, you have to break up the, the, the project of educating people into these different demographics there, you know, there's that preteen demographic, there's a teen demographic, there, there's the, there's, there's the even younger demographic than that. And, and that's just dividing it up by age. You also have to divide it up by socioeconomic cohort and, and find the strategy that works for each one of those and not think that there's a one size fits all approach to education. Cause there isn't. Cause if you go up to somebody with the idea that you're going to educate them, all you're going to do is have them turn their back on you and walk away. Uh, but you have to engage them as a human being and you have to engage them in something that matters to them on a, on a deeply personal level, if not a visceral level. And, uh, of course, not everyone has a talent to do that, uh, but some people do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anything else in the Q&A? Let's see. Uh, I don't see anything. Yeah, I'm going through it right now. Um, Patrick Festa is a Nick supporter. Oh, thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, and, I'm not. <laughs> Maybe a bit late to get into the race, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> you should have announced a few months ago, at least. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, I've got it all figured out. If I get. Uh, if I get uh, a, a write-in, uh, uh, if I get elected president by a write-in ballot, I'm going to have my sisters serve as first lady on a rotating basis. So I'm ready. <laughs> well, you I'll got you, the, you got I, the hard I, part figured out anyway. <laughs> when I run the world, I'll just go ahead and appoint you president. I understand from Donald Trump that foreign policy is not that hard. Anybody can figure it out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you just threatened two of the biggest superpowers on the planet. Yeah, well, works for him. Okay. Uh, 
because he has a jet he can haul ass out. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to go around the table again. Uh, get one last word and a recommendation. So uh, let's start with James. Okay. Uh, this is a lot of fun. I like seeing Mike's creature and you know hearing Nick talk about uh, funding science a lot better. Uh, these open topics are actually pretty fun because just anything comes flying out. Uh, let me see. My recommendation this week, uh, I'm going to recommend somebody that we've actually used on the podcast before, George Robb's music. Ah, George, uh, he's got yeah, a bunch sure. of albums, like Interrobang. Uh, one of my favorites of his is Book Camp, and another one is Trebuchet. And I'll post a link to his CD Baby page. Just okay. be real careful because apparently there is a adult contemporary love song crooner named George Harb. <laughs> 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 but yeah, they've got. I don't think you can make mistake the two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like yeah, George. But yeah, so I'm going to put him as my recommendation because he's got a lot of pretty good songs. Like I said, Coelacanth and Trebuchet, two, his two most recent are really good and I really get a kick out. Yeah, and I should point out that I wrote to James, I wrote, I'm sorry, I wrote to George a few months ago saying, actually about a year ago, saying, uh, can we use your song in our podcast? And he said, thanks for asking, free for you to use any of my songs in your podcast. Oh, so, right. uh, mm -hmm. thank you, George, yeah, by the way. He, if he's you, made all his <laughs> yeah, if you're out there and you're thinking of using right. your songs, I think it'd be at least courteous to write to him and ask him if it's okay. You know, just I'm sure he'll yeah, say he, yeah. He appreciates. I yeah, I contacted him for a little project I'm doing, and he appreciated it. Now, biggest thing I think he asks for is a link to so he can hear what you're doing. Yeah, uh, I don't think he makes a ton of money from his from his original music, but he uh, he likes people to hear it you know and he's got some more coming out soon so yeah well he oh. put uh, all the trebuchet out as just a free download basically yeah uh and uh of course the song far which we used on episode 20 mm -hmm. uh yeah <laughs> we, and it's it uh it's a lot of fun and he he he, uh, he shot a video for that which must have cost at least four or five dollars uh <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty which is actually pretty cute uh so uh okay uh, stop motion yeah yeah uh george is a, he has you know he has this shaved head and he he's very dapper so he's kind of a yeah just don't call him moby he does not like that <laughs> no uh okay uh <laughs> mike baller how about you well this is uh as always, the show's enlightening. Uh, I, I, I liked. Uh, uh, I, I think maybe we over, maybe overdid, maybe the uh, crazy, you know, the the crazy homeopathy stuff or you know natural stuff. But it, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a bit, and probably I'd like to recommend checking out Nick's blog. I, I I'm fortunately I. I don't know what you call. I forget what you call it. I'm drawing a blank, but it's a great. It's a. It is a great. It's a great blog. To, oh, it's the, gr uh, the grand strategy blog. Grand, the grand strategy. Yeah, and talk about my blog. Yeah. Your, grand your strategy. Blog. The view from Oregon. <laughs> yes, I really like it. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate I, that. Because I'm, I'm trying to understand a lot of things. I'm trying to understand economics. I'm trying to understand. Uh, because you, you delve into civilization, some of the origins and stuff like that, and a lot of a lot of neat stuff in there. And like I said, I, I, I'm I actually learning something from that, and I I, I would highly recommend uh, the listeners checking it out. Okay, uh, Nick, how about you? I would like to recommend the film Particle Fever, which I just saw last week. Uh, it uh, it's about the Large Hadron Collider, and the the, the at first um, you know obviously since the film has been finished, they've already remodeled it and restarted it at higher energies. But it it works up through the whole 
um, search for the Higgs boson at the first iteration of the Large Hadron Collider. And it's, a, it's a great film. It has a lot of interesting interviews with physicists and those involved with the management of the project, and it's a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, and um, my recommendation is going to be uh, – you probably already hinted at it. Uh, something that uh, Pamela Gay was involved in early on. It's called Galaxy Zoo. And it's part of the Zooniverse. And the Zooniverse is essentially a citizen science collective. Uh, you go into the Zooniverse, you can log in, and you can do lots of things like classify galaxies. And classifying galaxies is really interesting in my view. Maybe I'm just showing you what a big nerd I am, but uh, they show they will show you not just the pretty pictures from Hubble Space Telescope. They'll show you all kinds of galaxy images, and you will become expert at classifying them. And it's amazing how many different galaxies you will see and how much you can contribute to the actual cataloging of galaxy types. There, there are far, far more images of galaxies out there than the professional scientists can catalog. So you can you can do that. There, there's other things you can do in the universe, like looking for supernovas, uh, and many other things. Uh, they some not all of them are astronomy related. So, but you can start by going to galaxyzoo.org and just have some fun with it. Uh, you don't. They'll train you online and. They will, uh, and then you can start contributing to the science there. They have done serious science with this. It's uh, it's professional scientists interfacing with with citizen scientists. The same thing at CosmoQuest.org, uh, which is a little bit more planet focused on planets and the moon. So, uh, I recommend you go do that if you, you think I can't do science. The answer is, yes, you can do science. Anybody can do science, and you can start with the citizen science projects like that. And uh, that's it for tonight, I think. Uh, I'd like to point out that um, we have uh, we are on pace for a record month of downloads. Thank you for listening. If you're one of those downloaders, which you must be because you're listening to this right now, and please share us and also if you could give us a review on itunes we'd really appreciate that uh even more appreciated would be your support on patreon.com slash unseen podcast but uh most important is spread the word share we have this is the 47th episode i would encourage you to go back through the old episodes find some that you like and share those with your friends and followers. Uh, we have covered a lot of different topics. And if you go to unseenpodcast.com and click on our episodes, you will see every episode and links to those episodes. And you can listen to them online. Uh, you can all download them to your mobile device and listen to them there. You can also subscribe to the Unseen Podcast on iTunes or any number of other services. I personally use Pocket Casts on uh, Android, and which is also available on iOS. And you can find us at any of those services. Just go to those services, go to search, type in Unseen Podcast, and it'll pop right up. And then you can click subscribe. If you, if you subscribe, then each new episode will automatically appear in your on your device and you just have to click on it and it will you can listen to the episode right there and then so uh let us know what you think about each episode about future topics about future guests and uh james i think you're working are you working on a guest for a couple weeks from now trying to i honestly don't know if any able to join or if they're going to have time to come in. Yeah. Okay, well, we, James is hosting in about two weeks uh, on the April 1st episode, which I'm sure will be full of hijinks, uh, no matter what. Uh, the uh, I'm on for next week, although I'll be traveling, so it's going to be a bit tricky. We'll see what we can do. It, you may 
have a bit of a delay in the release of that one. Uh, we may have to change the time of it. If you're someone who would like to participate on the panel for this podcast, the panel is determined afresh each week. It's not the same people every week. And if you would like to be on one of the panels, all you have to do is send me an email, unseenpodcast at gmail.com. I'll tell you how you can get on to the panel and then uh, you'll start getting invitations and all you have to do is reply yes to the invitation and uh, people who have not been on before or have not been on frequently will have priority over those who have but I will also ask you to participate in the top in the discussion online about what the topic should be for that week the topics are not determined by me every week sometimes they're determined by the community sometimes it's it's a function of who we're having on as a special guest but uh, it's not just me dictating what the topics are because uh, it would be astronomy every time so uh, or SETI so uh, let, let's uh, let's engage with each other and even if you don't want to be on a panel you can you can comment we have a Google Plus listener community we have a Google Plus participants community we have a subreddit for listeners and we also have a Twitter account. You can follow us at Podcast on Scene and of course we read all those comments all those ideas and uh, we'd, have, we'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, you can also just email unseenpodcast at gmail.com and uh, so I think that's it for tonight. This has been episode 47 of the Unseen Podcast. And I'll go around one more time and let everybody say goodnight. Uh, James. Thanks again, Paul, and see you guys soon. And Mike. Good night, everyone. And Nick Nielsen. Good night. Okay. Good night. This has been Unseen Podcast episode. 47 it's now the 19th of march 2016 and we'll see you next week for episode 48 good night